Lesson 11 Mission to the Unreached, Part 2 Sabbath Afternoon, December 9 The fall of man filled all heaven with sorrow. Angels ceased their songs of praise. Throughout the heavenly courts, there was mourning for the ruin that sin had wrought. The Son of God, heaven's glorious commander, was touched with pity for the fallen race. His heart was moved with infinite compassion as the woes of the lost world rose up before him. But divine love had conceived a plan whereby man might be redeemed. The broken law of God demanded the life of the sinner. In all the universe there was but one who could, in behalf of man, satisfy its claims. Since the divine law is as sacred as God himself, only one equal with God could make atonement for its transgression. None but Christ could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. Christ would reach to the depths of misery to rescue the ruined race. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 63. We should cultivate the spirit with which Christ labored to save the erring. They are as dear to him as we are. They are equally capable of being trophies of his grace and heirs of the kingdom. But they are exposed to the snares of a wily foe, exposed to danger and defilement, and without the saving grace of Christ, to certain ruin. Did we view this matter in the right light, how would our zeal be quickened and our earnest self-sacrificing efforts be multiplied that we might come close to those who need our help, our prayers, our sympathy, and our love? Those only live for Christ and honor his name who are true to their master in seeking to save that which is lost. Genuine piety will surely manifest the deep longing and earnest labor of the crucified Savior to save those for whom he died. If our hearts are softened and subdued by the grace of Christ and glowing with a sense of God's goodness and love, there will be a natural outflow of love, sympathy, and tenderness to others. The truth exemplified in the life will exert its power like the hidden leaven upon all with whom it is brought in contact. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 605 and 606. Man is God's property, and angels are looking with intense interest to see how man will deal with his fellow man. When heavenly intelligences see those who claim to be the sons and daughters of God putting forth Christ-like efforts to help the erring, manifesting a tender, sympathetic spirit for the repentant and the fallen, angels press close to them and bring to their remembrance the very words that will soothe and uplift the soul. Holy angels are on the track of every one of us. We are not to despise the least of these. In Heavenly Places, page 100. Sunday, December 10. Mission to Regions Beyond. Christ says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. John chapter 17, verse 18. Every soul whom Christ has rescued is called to work in his name for the saving of the lost. When you turn from those who seem unpromising and unattractive, do you realize that you are neglecting the souls for whom Christ is seeking? At the very time when you turn from them, they may be in the greatest need of your compassion. In every assembly for worship, there are souls longing for rest and peace. They may appear to be living careless lives, but they are not insensible to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Many among them might be one for Christ. Christ's Object Lessons, page 191. All heaven is interested in the work of saving the lost. Angels watch with intense interest to see who will leave the ninety and nine and go out in tempest and storm and rain into the wild desert to seek the lost sheep. The lost are all around us, perishing and sadly neglected. But they are of value to God, the purchase of the blood of Christ. In Heavenly Places, page 100. 
As you engage in this work, ministering to the lost, you have companions unseen by human eyes. Angels of heaven were beside the Samaritan who cared for the wounded stranger. Angels from the heavenly courts stand by all who do God's service in ministering to their fellow men. And you have the cooperation of Christ himself. He is the restorer, and as you work under his supervision, you will see great results. Christ is seeking to uplift all who will be lifted to companionship with himself, that we may be one with him as he is one with the Father. He permits us to come in contact with suffering and calamity in order to call us out of our selfishness. He seeks to develop in us the attributes of his character, compassion, tenderness, and love. By accepting this work of ministry, we place ourselves in his school to be fitted for the courts of God. Christ's Object Lessons, page 388. The Savior has committed to his followers a wide mission. In the days of Christ, selfishness and pride and prejudice had built strong and high the wall of partition between the appointed guardians of the sacred oracles and every other nation on the globe. But the Savior had come to change all this. Christ tears away the wall of partition, the self-love, the dividing prejudice of nationality, and teaches a love for all the human family. He lifts men from the narrow circle that their selfishness prescribes. He abolishes all territorial lines and artificial distinctions of society. He makes no difference between neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. He teaches us to look upon every needy soul as our neighbor and the world as our field. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 42. Monday, December 11. Seeking the Multitudes. Jesus went up into a mountain, and there the multitude flocked to him, bringing their sick and lame, and laying them at his feet. He healed them all, and the people, heathen as they were, glorified the God of Israel. For three days they continued to throng about the Savior, sleeping at night in the open air, and through the day pressing eagerly to hear the words of Christ and to see his works. At the end of three days their food was spent. Jesus would not send them away hungry, and he called upon his disciples to give them food. Again the disciples revealed their unbelief. At Bethsaida they had seen how, with Christ's blessing, their little store availed for the feeding of the multitude. Yet they did not now bring forward their all, trusting his power to multiply it for the hungry crowds. Moreover, those whom he had fed at Bethsaida were Jews. These were Gentiles and heathen. Jewish prejudice was still strong in the hearts of the disciples, and they answered Jesus, Whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? But obedient to his word, they brought him what they had seven loaves and two fishes. The multitude were fed, seven large baskets of fragments remaining. Four thousand men, besides women and children, were thus refreshed, and Jesus sent them away with glad and grateful hearts. The Desire of Ages, page 404. We are not, as a people, sufficiently aroused to the short time in which we have to work, and we do not understand the magnitude of the work for the time. The night soon cometh in which no man can work. God calls for men and women to qualify themselves by consecration to his will and earnest study of the scriptures to do his special work for these last days. He calls for men now who can work, as they engage in the work in sincerity and humility to do all they can, they will be obtaining a more thorough experience. They will have a better knowledge of the truth and better know how to reach souls and help them just where they need to be helped. Workmen are needed now, just now, to labor for God. The fields are already white for the harvest, and yet the laborers are few. Life Sketches of Ellen G. White Page 211. There is a possibility of the believer in Christ obtaining an experience that will be wholly sufficient to place him in right relation to God. 
Every promise that is in God's book holds out to us the encouragement that we may be partakers of the divine nature. This is the possibility to rely upon God, to believe His Word, to work His works. This possibility is worth more to us than all the riches in the world. There is nothing on earth that can compare with it. As we lay hold of the power thus placed within our reach, we receive a hope so strong that we can rely wholly upon God's promises, and laying hold of the possibilities there are in Christ, we become the sons and daughters of God. Review and Herald, January 14, 1909 Tuesday, December 12, in Tyre and Sidon. Looking westward, Jesus could see, spread out upon the plain below, the ancient cities of Tyre and Sidon, with their heathen temples, their magnificent palaces and marts of trade, and the harbors filled with shipping. Beyond was the blue expanse of the Mediterranean, over which the messengers of the gospel were to bear its glad tidings to the centers of the world's great empire. But the time was not yet. The work before him now was to prepare his disciples for their mission. The people of this district were of the old Canaanite race. They were idolaters and were despised and hated by the Jews. To this class belonged the woman who now came to Jesus. She was a heathen and was therefore excluded from the advantages which the Jews daily enjoyed. There were many Jews living among the Phoenicians, and the tidings of Christ's work had penetrated to this region. Christ knew this woman's situation. He knew that she was longing to see him, and he placed himself in her path. By ministering to her sorrow, he could give a living representation of the lesson he designed to teach. For this he had brought his disciples into this region. He desired them to see the ignorance existing in cities and villages close to the land of Israel. The people who had been given every opportunity to understand the truth were without a knowledge of the needs of those around them. No effort was made to help souls in darkness. The partition wall which Jewish pride had erected shut even the disciples from sympathy with the heathen world. But these barriers were to be broken down. The Desire of Ages pages 399 and 400. During his earthly ministry, Christ began to break down the partition wall between Jew and Gentile and to preach salvation to all mankind. Though he was a Jew, he mingled freely with the Samaritans, setting at naught the Pharisaic customs of the Jews with regard to this despised people. He slept under their roofs, ate at their tables, and taught in their streets. The Savior longed to unfold to his disciples the truth regarding the breaking down of the middle wall of partition between Israel and the other nations, the truth that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with the Jews and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 and chapter 3 verse 6. This truth was revealed in part at the time when he rewarded the faith of the centurion at Capernaum and also when he preached the gospel to the inhabitants of Sychar. Still more plainly was it revealed on the occasion of his visit to Phoenicia when he healed the daughter of the Canaanite woman. These experiences helped the disciples to understand that among those whom many regarded as unworthy of salvation, there were souls hungering for the light of truth. The Acts of the Apostles, page 19. Wednesday, December 13. Send her away. The Savior manifested divine compassion toward the Syrophoenician woman. His heart was touched as he saw her grief. He longed to give her an immediate assurance that her prayer was heard, but he desired to teach his disciples a lesson, and for a time he seemed to neglect the cry of her tortured heart. When her faith had been made manifest, he spoke to her words of commendation and sent her away with the precious boon she had asked. The disciples never forgot this lesson, and it is placed on record to show the result of persevering prayer. 
It was Christ himself who put into that mother's heart the persistence which would not be repulsed. It was Christ who gave the pleading widow courage and determination before the judge. It was Christ who, centuries before, in the mysterious conflict by the Jabbok, had inspired Jacob with the same persevering faith. And the confidence which he himself had implanted, he did not fail to reward. Christ's Object Lessons, page 175. Jesus knows the burden of every mother's heart. He who had a mother that struggled with poverty and privation sympathizes with every mother in her labors. He who made a long journey in order to relieve the anxious heart of a Canaanite woman will do as much for the mothers of today. He who gave back to the widow of Nain her only son and in his agony upon the cross remembered his own mother is touched today by the mother's sorrow. In every grief and every need, he will comfort and help. In the children who were brought in contact with him, Jesus saw the men and women who should be heirs of his grace and subjects of his kingdom, and some of whom would become martyrs for his sake. He knew that these children would listen to him and accept him as their redeemer far more readily than would grown-up people, many of whom were the worldly wise and hard-hearted. In teaching, he came down to their level. He, the majesty of heaven, answered their questions and simplified his important lessons to meet their childish understanding. He planted in their minds the seeds of truth, which in after years would spring up and bear fruit unto eternal life. The Ministry of Healing, page 42. If the lost sheep is not brought back to the fold, it wanders until it perishes and many souls go down to ruin for want of a hand stretched out to save. These erring ones may appear hard and reckless, but if they had received the same advantages that others have had, they might have revealed far more nobility of soul and greater talent for usefulness. Angels pity these wandering ones. Angels weep while human eyes are dry and hearts are closed to pity. Oh, the lack of deep, soul-searching sympathy for the tempted and the erring. Oh, for more of Christ's spirit and for less, far less of self. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 191 and 192. Thursday, December 14. Faith on Earth? As the rays of the sun penetrate to the remotest corners of the globe, so God designs that the light of the gospel shall extend to every soul upon the earth. If the Church of Christ were fulfilling the purpose of our Lord, light would be shed upon all that sit in darkness and in the region and shadow of death. Instead of congregating together and shunning responsibility and cross-bearing, the members of the church would scatter into all lands, letting the light of Christ shine out from them, working as he did for the salvation of souls, and this gospel of the kingdom would speedily be carried to all the world. It is thus that God's purpose in calling his people from Abraham on the plains of Mesopotamia to us in this age is to reach its fulfillment. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 42 and 43. Christ gave up all in order that he might bring salvation to every people, nation, and tongue. He bridged the gulf that sin had made in order that through his merits man might be reconciled to God. Why is there not an army of workers enlisted under the blood-stained banner of Prince Emmanuel ready to go forth to bring souls out of darkness into light? Why do we not teach the perishing to believe in Christ as their personal Savior and aid them to see Christ by faith and wash in the fountain that has been opened to cleanse away the sins of the world? We should teach them how to cast away their old, sin-stained garments of character and how to put on Christ's righteousness. We should plant in their darkened minds the elevating, ennobling thoughts of heavenly things. By faith, by Christ-like sympathy and example, we should lead the polluted into pure and holy lives. We should live such a life before them that they will discern the difference between error and vice and purity, righteousness, and holiness. The Southern Work, page 27. 
In large cities, there are certain classes that cannot be reached by public meetings. These must be searched out as the shepherd searches for his lost sheep. Diligent personal effort must be put forth in their behalf. When personal work is neglected, many precious opportunities are lost, which, were they improved, would advance the work decidedly. Those who desire to investigate the truth need to be taught to study diligently the Word of God. Someone must help them to build on the sure foundation. At this critical time in their religious experience, how important it is that wisely directed Bible workers come to their help and open to their understanding the treasure house of God's Word. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 111. For further reading, My Life Today, Love Heals Many Wounds, page 179, and Life Sketches of Ellen G. White, Sewing Beside All Waters, pages 213 and 214.